Hello, everyone. Here at the Wilson Center's Global Europe Program, we are delighted to welcome you to the inaugural webinar for our Ukraine in Europe initiative. Our program is focused on Ukraine's European future, a future that Ukraine is fighting for on the ground today for the United States, for the Transatlantic Alliance, for the European Union, and for Ukraine itself. This is our shared historic challenge. For today's discussion, we are delighted to have Dr. Mariana Bujarin as our expert moderator. She is Senior Research Associate with the Project on Managing the Atom at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. It is only the latest in a series of prestigious appointments that she has held. She focuses her research on nonproliferation and arms control, as well as post-Soviet nuclear history. Her recent book is titled Inheriting the Bomb, The Collapse of the USSR and the Nuclear Disarmament of Ukraine. So Mariana, over to you. Thank you so much, Robin. And it is a pleasure for me to moderate this event, this first inaugural uh, webinar of Ukraine and Europe uh, program uh, initiative at the Global Europe program, the Wilson Center. Uh, the webinar today is dedicated to a historic, truly historic event that took place on December 1st, 1991, where uh, the Ukrainian people came out and voted overwhelmingly in support of the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine. And at that time, if we remember, the, some of the hopes of renewing the Soviet Union, of recasting it into a confederation, those hopes were still on the table. Those options were still on the table. And it is not an overstatement to say that the overwhelming uh, vote in favor of Ukraine's uh, political independence and sovereignty by the Ukrainian people uh, basically put the end to any possibility of renewing the Soviet Union and open uh, a new chapter in Europe's history. The following three decades uh, were a tumultuous time for the region and particularly uh, for Ukraine, that found itself uh, eventually wedged between an expanded uh, Euro-Atlantic alliance that came up to its borders on the West and an increasingly belligerent and revanchist Russia. Uh, and Ukraine's early commitment to neutrality and the attempt to balance between its uh, Eastern and Northern neighbor um, and the Euro-Atlantic community so soon gave way to a firm commitment for Euro-Atlantic integration. Ukraine made its European choice through a series of popular uprising, uh, uh, revolutions, uprisings, protests, but also through uh, a considered and consistent state policy. And so it is my great honor today to welcome a fantastic lineup of speakers to discuss the, the evolution of this choice for Ukraine and its challenges and, and opportunities um, on the course that Ukraine today pays a very, very great price for. This is the, it, we, we all could be in agreement uh, on the on the subject that, um, you know, it is Ukraine's European choice that is being defended today in the trenches in eastern and southern Ukraine. With us, we have um, a um, you have three prominent speakers. I cannot think of a better lineup of people to discuss um, these, these important questions. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. You will find their fuller bios on, on the event webpage. Uh, first, um, it is my pleasure to welcome Katerina Smahli, who is the first secretary uh, at the Embassy of Ukraine in Washington, D.C., with a portfolio for uh, political and public diplo diplomacy issues. Uh, formerly, she has been a director of the Kiev office of the Kennan Institute, uh, that is also part of the, of the Wilson Center family. Uh, she, in addition, she's a consultant on a number uh, to a number of international organizations. And in parallel to her diplomatic uh, career, Katerina uh, teaches. She teaches um, at the Leadership International, Re uh, Leadership International Relations for um, 
at the Donetsk National University and the uh, National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, which also happens to be our alma mater. Um, and uh, um, she um, she has been, you know, a prominent person in Ukraine's uh, civic engagements and academia. Uh, next, let me welcome Ambassador Roman Popadyuk. Uh, Ambassador Popadyuk uh, is a longstanding um, uh, United States Foreign Service uh, officer. He started his career uh, as a Foreign Service officer in 1981. Uh, he has served um, on the administrations of, uh, of President Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. And importantly for our today's uh, webinar, uh, Ambassador Propaduk uh, was the, served as the first ambassador to Ukraine. Um, in 1992 and 1993, he was the one who established U.S. diplomatic um, representation in newly independent Ukraine. And last but certainly not the least, it is my pleasure to welcome Danilo Lukivsky, uh, who is a Ukrainian diplomat and has been serving um, in Ukraine's foreign service since 19. 1998. Uh, uh, he is also um, an activist. He is the director of Kiev Security Forum presently, which is uh, you know, the, the foremost public platform for discussions of national, regional, and global security in Ukraine. Uh, formerly, uh, Mr. Lubkivsky served as a deputy foreign minister of Ukraine and on Ukrainian missions to uh, the United States nations. So without further ado, uh, we will uh, proceed to the discussions. But before we do, and we invite our speakers to share their remarks, we have a wonderful um, surprise, I suppose, and a treat for all of us. Ukraine's ambassador to the United States, uh, Oksana Markarova, has kindly recorded for us um, an address and a message. She unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, today in person, but I will ask the AV team to play her address for all of us. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to address the audience of today's webinar devoted to historic referendum of December 1st, 1991. Let me thank the Wilson Center's Ukraine in Europe initiative, and we're very glad that this initiative is now in work, as well as the program director, Robin Quinnwill, and Wilson Center's global fellow, Mariana Bujeran, for organizing today's discussion. The referendum of December 1st was, and still is, the true watershed moment in Ukraine's history. On that day, we went Ukrainians went to the poll to answer a very straightforward question. Do you support the act of declaration of the independence of Ukraine? More than 92% of voters said yes. There was not a single region in Ukraine that voted no. In Crimea, overwhelming majority of citizens voted for independence. In Donetsk, Luhansk, Odessa, and Kharkiv, over 80% of citizens expressed their will to have their own state. The vote does become a clear, unambiguous, and indisputable expression of the will of the people of Ukraine to establish an independent, sovereign Ukrainian state. The day after, Poland and Canada recognized Ukraine's independence, followed by all other countries of the world. Despite official recognition of free Ukraine by Moscow, the Russian political elites never accepted the Ukrainian, Ukrainian people's choice. Till the very last moment in 1991, the Russian leaders did not take Ukraine's ambitions for independence seriously. And it looks like they believed those had been just political speculations. Moscow could not put up with the fact that the empire has been overthrown. And they kept dreaming of drawing Kyiv back into some kind of renewed union. That neo-imperial and revanchist dream turned into war in 2014 and turned into a complete nightmare on February 24, 2022. Russia made a deliberate choice to become a terrorist state and a global threat by waging a genocidal war of aggression against Ukraine and committing unthinkable crimes and atrocities against Ukrainians. 
And thus, today, the incredibly brave Ukrainian defenders are fighting not only for liberation of our territories from Russian aggressors, not only for defending our home, homes and loved ones, they are also fighting for the results of the 1991 independence referendum and for very existence of our Ukrainian nation. We thank all of our international partners for standing ironclad in support of our country and our right for independence and sovereignty, and also for continuing defending with us rights and liberties on the front lines of democracy and freedom. Let me wish you very fruitful discussions. I am looking forward for the opportunity to join you in person at the next events organized by the Wilson Center's Ukraine in Europe initiative. And again, it gives me a great pleasure to say it, Ukraine in Europe initiative. God bless America, Slava Ukraini, and have a great discussion. Fantastic. Um, this has been um, a, a, a great opening for our discussion. Um, I will invite our speakers in turn to uh, to offer their reflections and their remarks uh, that they have pre prepared on the subject. And then I will we will open the discussion for the audience. Please uh, pose your questions into a Q and A box um, in the comments, and uh, I will read them out to our distinguished speakers. And without further ado. Uh, let me um, invite Katarina Smahli to start us off. Go ahead, Katya. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Ms. Quinville, Mariana, dear colleagues, Danilo and Ambassador Papadiuk. True, true pleasure to join uh, you this morning at this extremely important discussion about truly historic date in Ukraine's history. Uh, I'm, as Ambassador Markarova just mentioned, also truly thrilled about the Ukraine and Europe initiative being launched at the Wilson Center and wish this initiative all the very best of success in its academic and professional endeavors. Uh, before I begin my comment, I'd like to underscore that I join in my uh, academic capacity, not in my professional capacity as Ukraine's diplomat. Uh, and I'm truly uh, proud to have my academic capacity still uh, with me. So I will keep my remarks relatively short and make uh, only three uh, key points, uh, if you will. My first point will, of course, be about the context of today's webinar. There has been a great number of academic discussions about the importance of December 1st uh, referendum. And I remember in 2016, I myself moderated the discussion organized by the Kennan Institute, uh, which was attended by the late Nadia Duke, uh, NETS Vice President, uh, also already late Ambassador uh, Miller, and uh, a scholar from France, um, from Sciences Po. Uh, but this war that we currently see has absolutely changed our understanding uh, of what has truly happened on December 1st. Uh, that leads me to my next point about the very title of today's debate, from Soviet past to European uh, future. And I must say that it is not without its limitations because if we uh, understand Ukraine's uh, geopolitical determination, uh, in European integration, Euro-Atlantic integration, we must look not only at Ukraine's Soviet past, but look much deeper and in, so to say, zoom out and take Ukraine out of its Soviet capsule, because the Soviet period, if you look at it, lasted only 70 years. It's a very short time span compared to Ukraine's uh, and Kyiv Rus history that started in the 19th century. Despite all historic myths that the Soviet Union concocted to keep 15 republics together, Ukrainians always knew that the, Ky that the city of Kyiv was European, Ever since Grand Prince of Kiev, Yaroslav the Wise, has founded libraries and schools at the church uh, St. Sophia Cathedral and encouraged translations of Greek texts into church Slavonic. We all knew that we had European ties uh, ever since uh, Yaroslav the Wise's daughters married to European royalties and became queens of Norway, France, and Hungary. Um, the very fact that the Soviet movie, The Three Musketeers, based on the famous Alexander Dumas novel, was filmed not in Rostov-on-Don, 
but in the city of Lviv, which Danila Lubkivsky represents uh, on this panel, tells us that Ukraine is a European uh, country. Uh, let me even bring an anecdotal evidence that is directly related to the subject that we discussed today. And it brings me to the date very close to the referendum. As some of you may remember, on July 6, 1991, German Chancellor Hel Helmut Kohl and Soviet uh, leader Mikhail Gorbachev visited Kiev. In his memoirs years later, Gorbachev's foreign policy advisor, Anatoly Chernyayev, described Kiev as follows. I haven't been there for 35 years. It feels like a big Western European, I would even say German town. Beautiful streets, parks, clean, cozy, and as my driver says, lots of good food compared to Moscow. Ukraine can cope without us. Street protests carry slogans, yes to Kol, no to Gorbachev. So if we look at December 1st referendum uh, and try to figure out what the vote was all about, we understand that it was a completely unrestrained democratic vote, very natural and smooth, because on that day, Ukrainians basically chose between their totalitarian past and their democratic and European future. And it was an extremely easy decision to make. As someone who witnessed those events, uh, I can tell you that you know, no matter how much uh, the Soviet Union and uh, President Putin today says that the referendum and collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest catastrophe of the 20th century, we Ukrainians really took it as a sign of liberation and freedom. Because at that time, the empire truly exhausted itself. And again, despite all attempts to silence uh, that all totalitarian crimes committed by the Soviet regime, Ukrainians always knew uh, what kind of hardship they went through as a result of the Soviet uh, policies. Think about the Holodomor, which 90th uh, solemn anniversary we uh, mark uh, this year when millions were starved to death. Think about all the purges, Stalinist purges, when millions of Ukrainians were sent to Gulag just for the fact of speaking Ukrainian and uh, believing in their national identity. Think about all the sacrifices that we paid during the Second World War and think about Chernobyl when the nation of 52 million people finally realized that our so-called brothers in Moscow and in the Kremlin have complete disregard to our health, our safety, and that they're ready to send Ukrainian children and women to the May 1st parade instead of starting large-scale evacuation from the cities which had already been polluted with radiation. So this takes this brings me to the second point that I want to make is that although you, for Ukrainians, this 92% that they gave in support of the referendum was a very natural decision to make, it was not, as Ambassador Markarov also said, taken seriously, neither in Moscow, no in Western capitals, and we can develop through our discussion why uh, the West not initially was uh, taking Ukraine's referendum results uh, seriously. But we all understand that had we all studied Ukraine's history and really knew it as deeply as we understand it today, we would all understand that the referendum results was a very natural, natural result for us. And finally, the last point that I'd like to make is about the uh, traditional view that the, the referendum of December 1st led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. As we see today, and again, the Putin's revanchist war and everything that he started on 20, February 24th last year tells me that when the Soviet flag was lowered uh, on the Kremlin on December 25, 1991, the Soviet Union did not collapse. It was just the beginning of the empire's lengthy and very painful physical and mental decay. Russia and uh, Yeltsin also take, took numerous attempts to undermine the results of the referendum and constantly questioned Ukraine's sovereignty and European aspirations. And this evil empire is dying right now before our eyes, and it is being destroyed today on the battlefields in Ukraine. So circling back to the very first point that I made about the current war, 
I again underscore that it is our brave soldiers, Ukraine's brave soldiers, our paramedics, our volunteers, our communal workers who bring back electricity to cities after the Russian rockets destroy our electricity grids. We all continue this vote today. Our daily actions is a continuation of the December 1st referendum where we say once again, yes to the question that was posed in the bulletin. Do you support the act of Ukraine's independence? Again, as I said before, this was a very easy choice to make between totalitarianism, economic misery, subjugation, unlawfulness on the one hand, and the rule of law, diversity, liberty, and modernity about the future. Unfortunately, Russia has chosen a different path where the future is history, where the future is anti-modernity. And let me close my remarks by giving a very powerful quote from President Zelensky, who addressed uh, the people of Russia during his address on September 11, 2022. And I think the questions that he posed to Russians can again be put on the bulletin, and I'm confident that Ukrainians will answer positively in the way President Zelensky answered them. Read my lips, without gas or without you, without you, without light or without you, without you, without food or without you, without you. Cold, hunger, darkness, thirst are not as terrible and deadly for us as your friendship and brotherhood. But history will sort things out. Let me stop here and listen to the conversation. Katarina, thank you so much for for this, uh, for starting us off on such a strong note. And your, your point is very well taken, right? Soviet past was rather a Soviet interlude, uh, a terrible, interlude in, in a, for European people with a European history uh, entirely embedded in a European civilization from the, the times of the Kiev and Rus through the, the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth and further on. Uh, so um, this, is, this is a point very, very well taken. Um, Ambassador Popadiuk, I will invite you now to, to offer us uh, your reflections. Thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you for uh, having me this morning. Um, I look forward to a very successful discussion of the issue at hand. Um, I'd like to uh, congratulate you and Robin for undertaking this program. I think it's very important for the outside community to realize the importance of Ukraine, not only as a country, but also in terms of its relationship with the West. Uh, Katarina, Danilo, it's good to see you. And I look forward to, as I mentioned, to a very fruitful discussion. Uh, in my uh, comments, I think what I'd like to do is take more of a historical perspective and particularly zero in on the period when I served as ambassador. I think it might add some value to the discussion in terms of how Ukraine started moving toward its Western orientation, so to speak. Um, basically, over the last 10 years, as you well realize, particularly since 2014, uh, Ukraine has really intensified its relationship with the West. There's no doubt about it. And of course, this intensification was driven by its relationship with Russia, most obviously in 2014 with the takeover of Crimea and then the Russian invade, invasion of the full country of last year. It's pushed Ukraine increasingly into the hands of the West, as well as uh, has led the West to reach out to Ukraine. Um, this, uh, so basically, you, Ukraine's relationship with the West in many ways uh, is a reflection of its relationship with Russia. Uh, for Ukraine, it's important to move toward the West in order to maintain its independence, both in terms of uh, security as well as in terms of its economic and social uh, stability. Um, we have seen that uh, the West, in some cases, has, uh, so, well, let's put it this way, you, Russia's influence has been direct and indirect, direct in the sense of its invasions of Ukraine, and at the same time through the economic pressure that it's exerted on the country. It's been indirect in the sense that a lot of Western countries have felt that they have to cater to Russia in order to maintain the political as well as economic relationship with, uh, with Russia. And this is most evident in the issue of the debate regarding NATO, whether Ukraine should be a member of NATO. There have been 
uh, a number of countries in Europe that have been kind of hesitant to uh, foster this um, role for Ukraine, given their relationship with uh, Russia. There's also a false assumption in many of these countries, and I think in the greater outside community, that for some reason Russia, Russia has a special sphere of influence in Ukraine, given its historical control of parts of Ukraine and the fact that there's a large segment of uh, Ukrainians are of ethnic Russian uh, descent. Um, this is kind of a false assumption for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which, of course, is that uh, uh, good portions of Ukraine have had Western influences throughout the centuries, uh, and particularly during the Austro-Hungarian Empire, when uh, Ukrainians had a more liberalization in their own sphere of interest. And a lot of this spread into other parts of Ukraine as well. And people forget uh, that Ukraine had its own history of democracy long before Russia even thought about democracy, I would uh, venture to say, in the Cossack tradition of the Zaporozhian Cossacks, in terms of how they elected their hetman and the feelings of freedom that uh, the uh, Cossack Brotherhood generated. So Ukraine has a platform for uh, democratization as well as a, a platform for leaning toward the West. Um, the current assumption that uh, there is a predilection on the part of Ukraine toward Russia because of the large Russian uh, ethnic minority is false also. Because if you look at the history of it, basically that predilection is based on two things that have really nothing to do with politics, I would venture to say. The first is that this is a nostalgia on the part of an older generation for the Soviet past. Uh, with the independence of Ukraine, a lot of dislocations took place, particularly obviously in the economic sphere. And this unsettled a lot of people. Another issue is the cultural one, the use of the Russian language. And then, of course, there was the disruption of economic trade as well as travel because of the international border. A lot of this was um, the result of that. It had nothing to do with the politics. And I point, and I will point to two things here in this case. First is the 1991 referendum. Uh, our speakers have all mentioned the 1991 referendum. They've given the numbers. Ambassador Makarova was kind enough to outline the percentages. Uh, there's no need for me to go over that. But the key ingredient here is why did the people vote this way? The main reason the people voted this way is because they felt that they had a greater chance for economic and social success for themselves and their children, their families in an independent Ukraine than in being tied to Russia. So that clearly demonstrated that Ukraine was not going to be part of the old Soviet sphere. It was moving definitely toward the West, which I showed in my earlier comments, uh, had an underpinning in their traditions. Um, the other thing I, I would point to is Crimea. During the time I served as ambassador and even after my time there, there was a lot of uh, political unrest in Crimea in the sense that the Russian Duma was passing all kinds of uh, uh, resolutions and uh, uh, passages claiming that uh, Sevastopol is a Russian city, Crimea is, is should be part of Russia, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing transpired during those times, mind you. The Ukrainians were able to deal with the issues in eastern Ukraine as well as in Crimea very peacefully and logically in a way that solved the issues. It was not until 2014 when the little green men from Russia showed up. In short, basically, Ukraine is able to deal with its own internal issues on its own. It's only when Russia physically gets involved that you have the dislocations in the war situation and the disruption in the society. So this thing that a lot of people say that uh, Ukraine is geared, or particularly Eastern Ukraine is geared toward a predilection for uh, a Russian relationship is really a, a, a false assumption in many ways. It's only when Russia gets physically involved that obviously this takes place because the Russians tilt the balance of power in favor of themselves. So that, that's very important to understand from those two instances, the Crimea situation uh, during the early 1990s and uh, then, of course, in uh, the 1991 referendum. The relationship of Ukraine and the West is based on the relationship with the United States. How the United States uh, looks upon Ukraine, supports Ukraine, obviously will determine to, to a great extent the relationship with the greater West. Uh, and I think the key feature here to recall is that in May of 1992, President Kravchuk made an official visit to the United States. 
and he was welcomed with an official visit, which included a luncheon and meetings. Uh, we also made every effort at that point to uh, highlight the importance of Ukraine to the United States, as well as to the Western world. In this case, uh, we had a joint news conference held by President Bush and President Kravchuk in the East Room of the White House. Uh, we also had a situation, for example, where we wanted to uh, highlight Ukraine's special standing and the, and the standing of its President Kravchuk. Uh, on the protocol uh, procedure, it is usually common for the visiting head of state to visit with the vice president of the United States at the White House. But the Ukrainians insisted that since President Kravchuk was a president and Dan Quayle was a vice president, that the vice president Quayle should visit the, the president, uh, which was a break in protocol for the United States. And what we did is we compromised very sensibly to uh, play to the Ukrainian sensitivities. Uh, President, Vice President Quayle was on the hill that day uh, of the meeting that was that the meeting was planned. And on his way back to the White House, he stopped at Blair House where President Kravchuk was staying and got out of his car and went into Blair House and visited with the president. So it was a, a kind of a compromise. Well, what I, I, I share this anecdote with the audience just to show that the United States did everything it could to highlight Ukrainians, uh, uh, Ukraine's role uh, with the United States and to play to the sensitivities of Ukraine as a newly independent country and to highlight its role in forthcoming role uh, in the world uh, situation. During that visit, we also undertook a number of measures, technical assistance, OPEC, which is now the uh, Development Finance Corporation, uh, credits, uh, technical assistance, as I mentioned. We did everything we could uh, to highlight the budding relationship with the United States and the West. Uh, I know Foreign Minister Zlenko at that time left feeling very uh, happy that uh, meetings were very successful, that we had highlighted Ukraine's role, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so we got off on a very good start, and Ukraine got off on a very good start in terms of not only the bilateral relationship, but in terms of its relationship with the greater uh, Western world. Unfortunately, a lot of things developed internally in Ukraine that kind of took Ukraine off this track to a great extent. And I like to just highlight some of these because I dealt with these on an almost daily basis with the Ukrainian leadership. One of the biggest challenges that the Ukrainians had was the old Soviet mentality that existed. Uh, it was very difficult to start taking a country and change it overnight after 70 years of Soviet influence, communist ideology and change it into a market economy. And I, I always point to a meeting I had with uh, then Prime Minister Kuchma when he first came into office as Prime Minister uh, in uh, the fall of 1992. I had a meeting with, uh, with uh, Kuchma and we discussed uh, various issues of economics and politics of Ukraine. And I pushed them on the issue of uh, economic reform, the need for Ukraine to under undertake a process of economic reform. And he, he leaned back and kind of uh, uh, started laughing, kind of, and said, Pande Romane, you know, as you all know, they call you by your first name there, Pande. And um, he said, listen, you don't have to lecture me. He said that in a friendly way, not in a scolding way. You don't have to lecture me. I've been a communist all my life. I've got all kinds of medals to prove how uh, my all kinds of medals to prove my allegiance and my knowledge of communism and my achievements and everything. He said, but then he said, you know, there's one thing we know we have to move forward. The problem is we don't know how to. And that's kind of summarized the problem that Ukraine faced. Uh, and that the West didn't realize when it started dealing with uh, with Ukraine. Another another uh, story I'd like to share with you to kind of underscore this is in my meetings with Kravchuk, I've always spoke to him about economic reform, the need for reform, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, listen, listen, Pande Romani, uh, here's the issue. For many decades, we've been telling people that capitalism is no good, that it's evil. Now, all of a sudden, We've changed and we're, going, we're telling people capitalism is good. It takes a while for people to adjust. I'm sharing these two anecdotes just 
to let you know that the turmoil that the society was going through in terms of adjusting to the new reality, unfortunately, and this reflected in the West where people thought that Ukraine did not want to move forward on reform. Their hands were kind of tied because of the Soviet mentality. At the same time, I remember talking with the Ukrainian leaders about their fears of Russia interfering possibly in Eastern Ukraine. As I outlined earlier, the large ethnic uh, a Russian uh, community that lives in Ukraine, Ukrainian ethnic Russian community, and the fear that they might stoke troubles there. And so the Ukrainians had to move very gingerly, not to upset that, also to be able to get the greater U uh, Ukraine society to buy into the notion of economic reform and move forward. I'm not making an excuse for the, for the Ukrainians. I'm just saying these are the issues and the challenges that the Ukrainians face. Um, another another issue that was uh, very important here was um, the issue. Uh, let's let's put it this way: uh, you had the economic reform, as I mentioned, but the uh, other issue was Russia. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset of my comments, Russia kind of colored the uh, Ukrainians' uh, outreach to the West and its relationship with the West. Um, for Russia, this was for for the West. When the Soviet Union fell apart, we obviously, meaning the West and the United States, recognized the constituent republics and Russia as separate and, and independent countries. Unfortunately, from the Western perspective, there was a view that uh, the emphasis should lie with Russia, not only because of the nuclear weapons and its large size, et cetera, but the feeling was that if Russia could develop as a democracy, as in a market economy, that this would impact Russia in two ways. Number one, Russia would move away from its imperial past of being in an empire. And at the same time, this obviously would uh, diminish the chances of Russia trying to reach back into the constituent republics and trying to control them. So there was a the feeling of this. And the another point of view was that while we needed to support Russia in these two goals, it was also important to support the constituent republics, particularly Ukraine. Because what if what if the situation evolved that Russia did not develop as a democracy or did not develop as a market economy and its imperial past came back to color its policies? Uh, unfortunately, the this was a a um, not a very uh, let's see prevalent view in. Uh, government at that time, and I know in the United States it wasn't a very prevalent view. Uh, so the emphasis on Russia continued for the various reasons I had mentioned. Uh, there was also a more practical issue for the United States and the West not being particularly too uh, supportive of U of Ukraine, and that was uh, the United Ambassador States. Ambassador Papaduk, if I could just uh, ask you to, to wrap up so we can have okay. time for this. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, we, we were we were running out of money. We had put a lot of money into Russia and into Eastern Europe, particularly Poland, and therefore the finances were not that great in terms of how much we could supply to uh, Ukraine. So I'm sorry, but I'll be happy to address the issues and questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for giving us that retrospective. And as you say, the, the Russia's influence was not only direct in terms of what it could do in Crimea and elsewhere, but indirect in the sense of failing to... Uh, to develop a, a model of political and economic governance that anyone in its vicinity would want to follow voluntarily, sure. right? Not, not just by being coerced. And I would like to, to remind our esteemed audience to please um, uh, put questions in the, we already have some that came in, please put questions in the Q&A um, in the Q&A box um, uh, at the events page. Uh, and with that, let me turn to our last speaker, um, uh, Danilo Lubkivsky. Uh, please, Mr. Lubkivsky, the floor is yours. I, I do. Thank you, dear Mariana. I would like to start by thanking dear Robin Quinnwell and Mariana Bujarin, the Wilson Center and Ukraine in Europe initiative for inviting me to speak at this important event. Uh, I'm privileged to be here together with my distinguished uh, colleagues and such distinguished speakers as Ambassador Roman Popadyuk and Dr. Katarina Smahli. Uh, I remember very well when the United States recognized Ukraine on the 26th of December 1991, 32 years ago, and appointed Roman Popaduk as its first ambassador to Ukraine in 1892. 
I, I would like to thank you, uh, for Ambassador Popaduk, for, for your outstanding service and pay tribute to the generation of American diplomats who have contributed to the strategic partnership between our nations since 1991. Pane Romane, as you mentioned, Pane Romane, we thank you very much. From Ambassador Popaduk to Ambassador Bridget Brink, the 10th incumbent ambassador of uh, the United States to Ukraine. For years, Ukraine have enjoyed the support of many wise, thoughtful, and skilled American professionals who established a remarkable Ukrainian school in the United States Foreign Service. And we do appreciate this. We have, we have also managed to introduce our own diplomatic school of the American affairs, represented here but one, by one of the brightest Ukrainian diplomats, Katarina Smahli. So we closely worked together and we managed to receive and to, to, to bring about many useful results and achievements. Definitely for me, this is difficult to speak after such distinguished speakers since uh, many points uh, uh, somehow they coincide. But I would like to add a number of things that uh, look important to me. And I will uh, speak mostly about the key features of the Ukrainian geopolitics. And here, let me name a number of those features that uh, are essential, uh, apparently essential in our conversation. First of all, what's, what is Ukraine's geopolitics? A true, real, independent Ukraine has always been an integral part of Europe. If there is a real Ukraine, it definitely means that this is a European nation. If there is no real Ukraine, there is nothing about the European integration. Point number second, as an integral part of Europe, nowadays Ukraine is strategically interested in a strong and united Europe with a strong bond with a strong United States, internally united and globally committed. It means that Ukraine is a reliable pillar of what Robin calls the transatlantic alliance and union. This is about Ukraine. This is what Ukraine means. Point number three, geopolitically, the modern Ukrainian statehood is the antithesis of imperialism and chauvinism in our part of Europe. This is very important. Such a posture is deeply rooted in our history, going back to some dark ages when Kiev fight, fought against Constantinople. The anti-imperialist tradition is one of the defining features of the Ukrainian national diplomacy of the 20th century. And of course, this is the essence of what we are doing now at war with Russian imperialism today. Point number four. In world history, Ukraine plays a role of a game changer. As Ambassador Popaduk put it, Ukraine breaks protocols, both in the White House and other capitals. Ukraine breaks, breaks those protocols. In many decisive moments, Ukraine's positioning and future have strategically influenced the overall developments in Eastern Europe and beyond. But Ukraine is not a simple game changer. Here comes the fifth feature of our geopolitical mission, if I may say so. Our statehood has the potential and capacity to be the guarantor of what Henry Kissinger called equilibrium. Strong Ukraine can maintain, maintain a balance in our region influencing the wider expanses of the continent, including Russia. For this particular reason, Russia attacked Ukraine. On the 24th of February, 2022, together with my wife, we decided to remain to stay in Kiev. Like thousands of other volunteers, I joined the local self-defense. I did not take to arms, but I did what my brothers in arms deemed necessary. Like many other colleagues of mine, I communicated with the international community, our partners, and informed them of the state of affairs in Kiev and beyond, and called on them to take a proactive approach. Why did the Ukrainians take up arms to resist? 
because in their hearts and minds, the Ukrainians have already defeated Russian imperialism. Ukrainians have rejected the Russian idea, the revisionist concept that Putin tries to impose on his neighbors. And for this reason, the referendum of the 1st December is so important because it sealed the borders of Ukraine forever. No fake referenda conducted by the occupants may uh, somehow undermine the, the results of the referendum of the, of, of the 1st of December of 1991, when even Crimea voted, the majority of people in Crimea voted in favor for the Ukrainian independence and, uh, and uh, it's not internationally recognized borders. This is not only the war waged by Putin and his henchmen. This is the war waged by the Russian political mentality, culture, and attitude to life, to human rights, to freedoms of other peoples. It is not only Putin who kills us. We are killed by everyone accepting or tolerating the sinister right to atrocity. For quite a while, I have constantly repeated that there should be should have been no illusions of a quick victory. There is no quick victory. At the same time, there is no reason to despair either. To defeat Russian aggression, it is vital to continue and ramp up all possible military, political, and economic efforts to strengthen Ukraine's potential to win, to overcome the invaders and liberate our temporarily occupied territories. We, we must speak most unambiguously about the mortal danger of Russian imperialism to the world order. We do not know what future awaits Russia. Eliminating Russia's potential to commit military or any other type of aggression against the world is a cl crystal clear and unconditional task for the international community. Russia must be brought to justice and Russia's design must be subjected to changes. This is a crucial issue for international relations of the 21st century. The evil cannot be stopped or convinced by any form of appeasement or so-called carefulness. Forward-looking change and fine-tuning of international means to prevent, counteract, and punish the crime of aggression should be seen as a priority task of fundamental importance. It envisages the reform of the United Nations and its Security Council. It means the improvement and enlargement of the Western collective, collective system. It means that Ukraine should become an EU and NATO member. There is no alternative for these goals if we want to ensure a long-lasting peace in Europe and a rules-based order globally. Ukraine breaks protocols. We are at the point when all of us should break those protocols. If we do not, we will lose. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Danilo. This was a very powerful um, intervention. And uh, we do have uh, some questions from the audience that uh, that have already come in and one is from uh, um, from a, our listener in um, Indonesia uh, that basically <laughs> shows perhaps as indicative of, of the way the global south and many of the countries far afield that are removed from sort of internal um, uh, European affairs might view this war and, and what is going on in Ukraine. And um, our, our viewer says, um, why after, you know, seeing how costly this, uh, this conflict is, why wouldn't both sides just lay down arms and, and uh, decide to, to let each other go their own way. What is it that prevents the, the peaceful resolution of this conflict? Uh, another listener from, um, from Japan, evidently, I'm assuming here by the name, uh, if I assume wrongly, please forgive me. Um, another listener is saying, uh, can the Minsk agreement of 2014 um, uh, perhaps uh, they meant 2015 as well, uh, be a starter for a new um, peace settlement or uh, a resolution um, that if Russian army retreats from Eastern and Southern territories, um, 
occupy that it occupies and somehow um, a grain deal might be revived using uh, using um, uh, so sort of uh, using Siberian railways actually to deliver it to Indo-Pacific region. Uh, that assumes that that question is very interesting because it it highlights you know the opportunities that could exist under different kinds of circumstances. Right? They they might seem far fetched today, but what are the what are the um, the kinds of factors, what are the things that preventing uh, any of these possibilities from from being brought to fruition? And if you could just also reflect on the question from my uh, uh, from from for me personally, um, I'll turn to each one of you and turn to reflect upon this. What are some of the um, biggest missed opportunities of the past 30 years in this advent of Ukraine, in this march towards uh, towards Europe, not only in the part of Ukraine, but but also in the part of other actors. What are some of the bis- biggest missed opportunities uh, in that path? And where do you see sort of in the future some of the, the greatest promise, right? Uh, the, the biggest... Um, uh, the biggest opportunities to take advantage of and the biggest benefits and to make these things that our listeners are posing possible. Uh, I'll turn in turn to Katerina first and then Ambassador Papaduk and then Mr. Lukiski. Katerina. Thank you. First and foremost, I would warn uh, from using the word conflict when we look uh, and try to analyze what's going on right now between Russia and Ukraine, because for us, um, it is um, a war, it is unprovoked aggression, uh, it is an absolutely criminal criminal aggression on behalf of the Russian Federation. There is no conflict between Ukraine and Russia, and I might say that uh, for average Ukrainian, uh, Russia didn't matter that much uh, for the last 30 years. You know, Russia... Uh, absolutely lost its relevance for the United States, for the Western world, because it's a declining power. And unfortunately, Russian leaders understand it very well. So for them, in order to be relevant, the only way is to provoke conflicts one after another. And that is how they stay in the news, so to say. the only way for us to end this war right now is for Russian Federation to withdraw its arms, if its troops from our territory. Because if you if Russian army is leaving Ukraine's territory, the war will be over. If Ukrainians stop fighting, there will be no Ukraine. And that is the answer to, to the question that was uh, asked. About the missed opportunities, I believe the biggest oppor- lost opportunity is the security vacuum in which Ukraine has found itself after we gave up on our third largest nuclear potential and the guarantees and assurances that we received in uh, uh, in, in uh, response to that have, didn't work. And so the uh, international community should have been paying much more attention to the revanches, totalitarian tendencies that still existed in the Russian Federation and should have taken warning signals about Russia's uh, malign influences, not only over Ukraine, but over the Western civilization, Western world, much more, much more seriously. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you so much. And, you know, it's... Um... It always surprises me that uh, you, a lot of times representatives of the global South uh, fail to see this as a as a war of colonial conquest, you know. And the question is, well, you know, if you think of say Indonesia, what could bring the 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 Dutch and and the Indonesians to stop fighting and to you know give each other a hug and make up and and make nice, or the Japanese who arrived there in 1945? Much of it is about power and coercion uh, in international politics. And these are not the choices that Ukraine has made. Ambassador Pupaduk, uh, if you could reflect on some of these questions. Sure, thank you. I think the best way to deal with the issue of why the war can't stop at this stage is to go back to July of uh, 2021 in uh, Putin's famous article in which he outlined 
in his view, that Ukraine never existed as a country and that there's no such thing as a Ukrainian people, that this is all a, a fiction, according to Putin. So basically what you're fighting here is a war of identity. Ukrainians are fighting for their own identity, their own territory. So besides the points of, you know, fighting for democracy and freedom, this is a fight for a cultural and national identity for the Ukrainians. And that's why it's going to be very difficult to be able to solve this war. It's in the Russian hands to stop the war. The Ukrainians have to keep fighting in order to preserve their identity, their own territory. So it's a national identity issue, um, uh, first and foremost, for the Ukrainians. Uh, in terms of missed opportunities, I'd go back to something I mentioned in my opening comments. So in the early part of the post um uh, Soviet fall, we put an inordinate emphasis, we meaning the West, put an inordinate emphasis on Russia and its ability or hope, to, its ability to become a democratic and a market economy. Uh, and that as a result of that, it would uh, ameliorate its or undermine its uh, you know, imperial uh, tendencies. That proved false. Now I think we're in the same boat. We, we're constantly catering or taking Russia into view in the rear view mirror, how will Russia react? And I think that's been one of the biggest problems in the Ukraine war. The West has been supportive of Ukraine, but we're always supportive a little too late with too little. Uh, we always give them the, the, the required equipment uh, after the situation. If we had given them the required equipment and arms ahead of time, I think we'd be in a different situation right now, quite frankly, and this war would have changed uh, circumstances much sooner in favor of Ukraine if Ukrainians had been given all the proper arms. Thank you so much, Ambassador Papaduk. And just to uh, to piggyback on your point, this is a war of for identity, not just for Ukraine. Ukraine has actually firmed up its identity. It it has uh, you know blossomed into its identity uh, throughout the, the the past at least couple of decades. Um, but it's a big war of identity for Russia, the kind of state Russia uh, will become. And, and this is a, a good place to mention a big, you know, friend of Ukraine and a very profound geopolitical thinker, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who had, uh, you know, years, uh, decades ago, observed that without Ukraine, Russia stops being an empire. Is that the kind of identity, the post-imperial identity that Russia can li live with. And the answer to that has been uh, no into 2014 and uh, 2022. Uh, Mr. Lubkivsky, if you could offer your reflections too. I do, thank you, Mariana. Uh, it's difficult for me to, to, to answer those questions since almost all points have been already said by my distinguished colleagues. And I feel that uh, it may uh, this situation will be repeated later as well, <laughs> you know, for, uh, since uh, uh, almost all arguments uh, are on the table, and it is absolutely clear uh, if we talk about these three important questions. Uh, let me add just a little, just a few points. Uh, I will start from the third question. Uh, what uh, opportunities do I see? Uh, I agree with Ambassador Popaduk. The miss opportunity number one is, and please pardon my, uh, the, f f I'm, I, I'm, uh, please, uh, uh, f I'm sorry for being so, f so f uh, blunt here. Uh, f the first missed opportunity is the fact that the Russian people betrayed their democracy. They simply didn't support it. And for that reason, the regime of Putin came into power. Uh, Russia missed the opportunity to become a nation state, to become a democratic state. And I believe this is the biggest blow uh, for, for the global affairs uh, of, the, of the 21st century. Uh, the second missed opportunity, in my opinion, is that the, the Western diplomacy and the Western community was afraid to notice that uh, to notice the revival of the Russian imperialism in those brutal forms as we uh, see it today in Ukraine. And point number three, I believe this is the Bucharest NATO summit. Uh, the very fact that Ukraine and Georgia 
were not invited to, I mean, were not uh, uh, granted with the membership action plan and uh, for, in real terms invited to become uh, for the NATO members, simply encouraged Putin to start his aggression against Georgia, against Ukraine, and then against the West. These three missed opportunities, uh, for, uh, for, in my opinion, are uh, for, for the most uh, obvious uh, for features of what we went through. Uh, two questions. Uh, I will. I will. I will join them, and I, I will tell you that if we consider, if we talk about the Minsk agreements, can we use the Minsk agreements today? Definitely, this is impossible. And I, I agree uh, with Katarina, who said that if Ukraine lays arms, there will, there will be no Ukraine. Ukraine will be gone. If Russia lays its arms, there will be peace. Um, uh, certainly, this is, this is very clear that the war which is waged by Russia against Ukraine is of genocidal existential nature. They simply want to destroy Ukraine, to dismember Ukraine to impose its control upon Ukraine, and then to move further. In my opinion, there is no any kind of peaceful settlement that Putin keeps in mind. Look at the, at the military budget that they ad adopted recently, just a few days ago, uh, for, uh, which is intended to finance the military efforts of Russia in, uh, in the war against Ukraine. Uh, the volumes of that budget almost are comparable or even bigger than the volumes of the Soviet military budget. This is the budget of war, not of peace, not of negotiations. They, they wish, they want to, um, uh, uh, to continue this war effort, but also they want to see that the West is tired, that the West wants to stop it anyhow. And for that, this is one of the most dangerous developments that we witness today, I think. Thank you so much, Mr. Lubkivsky. And we are unfortunately at the end of our time, uh, even if not at the end of the interest in this subject. Um, one thing that seems clear to me from this discussion that Ukraine's European future is very much also about the staying power of Europe and the commitment of Europe to its own values and to its own uh, proclaimed goals and, and to its own word, right? Uh, staying true to that also means the, to supporting these uh, dem democratic aspirations of the country that so, so badly needs uh, that support. Uh, with that, thank you all so much for joining us. I will remind the audience that this event will uh, will be available in its recording online on the uh, program's webpage, um, and we'll be circulating the link to that when the, when the recording is uh, available. Uh, with that, um, uh, the, the webinar is officially over, and thank you all so much once again for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.